The Forge Worlds of the Imperium of Man are marvels of human ingenuity whose creation can stretch back to the Dark Age of Technology. Each of the major surviving Forge planets has a rich and glorious history with a robust and well-established society. These planets have existed for so long that many of the inhabitants of the planet, whether they be nobles or the average citizen, has absolutely no idea how important and unique the technologies they use on a day-to-day -day basis truly are. Such is the case for the glorious Forge world of Lucius, sometimes referred to as the Hollow Forge. And with that said, I want to welcome you guys back to another 40 Facts About the 40k Universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and today we're going to be talking about the Forge World of Lucius, one of the major uh, factions within the Adeptus Mechanicus Codex that you could actually play on the tabletop. They have special rules and everything. If you guys are new to the channel, we post Warhammer 40k lore videos every single day. What I try to do is I create a video with a lore portion in the beginning, a hobby portion usually in the middle if I can, and then towards the end I just answer some questions that you guys left off in yesterday's 40 facts video so if you guys have any questions about the 40k universe uh, or any comments that you guys would like me to react to in tomorrow's video just comment down in the comment section below i think it's easier to respond to comments uh, in video form than it is um you know the regular way um, but with that said let's get into 40 facts on the forge world of lucius Classified as a Super Natura Majoris, the Forge World of Lucius is a vast, hollowed planet whose industrial sprawl carpets its inner surface. In the planet's empty heart burns an immense artificial sun, a fusion mega-reactor that the Lucian tech priests claim to have built, but whose origin may be more mysterious. What makes the powerful Forge World of Lucius so interesting is that it suffered the perils of doctrinal descent. Long ago, the planet's Forge Star almost was sent into critical overload during the infamous Encalcata Schism. Lucius survived the near catastrophe and has ever since been a blazing beacon of orthodoxy and compliance with the dictates of Mars. Their tech priests have proven to be fierce of faith and dynamic of action. They are truly devoted servants of the Omnissiah. Moreover, the incalculable energy yield of their artificial star ensures that the Lucian Magi stand at the forefront of martial production. Their world has the capacity to fashion many incredible technologies, not least of which is the proprietary alloy Lucian. This remarkable substance is incorporated into the ornate masterwork weapons and bionics, which are granted to the most worthy Skatari and the marshals that lead them. More than this, Lucius pattern weapons and war engines have all garnered a well-deserved reputation for excellence across the vast swaths of the Imperium, from the radium carbines and the galvanic rifles of Lucius' own Skatari, to the half-mile-long void ship lance arrays, heavily armored battle tanks, mass-stamped las guns, and bizarre techno-esoterica. The mark of this forge world is the byword of quality and efficiency. Amongst the most amazing of Lucius' technologies are the immense god engines of its Titan Legion. Known as the Legal Ostorum, or more commonly known as Warp Runners, these machines glory in the unique ability to teleport directly into battle. It goes without saying that the sudden appearance of a towering engine of destruction upon the battlefield has won more than one battle in a spectacular fashion, with weaker-willed foes fleeing in panic or dropping dead from terror before the Legal Ostorum engine so much as opened fire. Yet the Warp Runners are far from Lucius' only proud martial asset ever eager to strike out into the galaxy and take from it the natural resources to feed the blessed forges, Lucia's macro clads are amongst the swiftest and the most aggressive fielded by any forge world. Iron Striders and Doom Crawlers surge towards the enemy with ferocious speed, often outrunning the enemy before they realize their peril. The genius and innovation of the Tech Priest of Lucius was displayed anew when a splinter fleet of High Fleet Leviathan invaded the planet. Dispatching their legal cybernetica and a great host of battle servitors to the planet's outer surface, the Tech Priest Dominus largely fought their battles from below the planet's crust. By tracking the motions of their servant clades and controlling activities via data tether, they waged their war without risking direct harm. Wherever the Tyranid Swarm overcame their servitor armies, the Tech Priests waited for the Xeno Predators to devour the meager biological components before sending Servo Skull Swarms to carry the most vital of the remaining machine parts below the crust of the planet. There they were installed into fresh recruits, and the next wave was sent back into the surface. Though it took months to accomplish, the resulting war of attrition ended in victory. Deprived of biomatter, the Tyranid Splinter Fleet was forced to feed upon itself to generate replacement brutes, and the Xenos could not keep pace with the recycled machinery parts and the refurbished robots. And that was the lore to the Forge World of Lucius. What's interesting about the Forge World of Lucius, uh, aside from the fact that um, 
the lore of most of these Forge worlds is not very different. Um, and I've talked about this before in a previous 40 Facts video. Um, the color schemes are also not very different. So, like, they're either a variation of red, black, gray, and tan. Um, like, I wish... I think there's one that has teal. Um, but I wish, like, there was more color variations with a purpose. Because, like, red makes sense. Like, the color red is supposed to represent the Martian sand, which is a holy color for the Adeptus Mechanicus. Uh, so, like, the priesthood... Um, the priesthood of Mars holds on to like the color red as a um, uh, a symbol of their like uh, of divinity because like the red planet and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it makes sense that that would be incorporated into most um, factions, but um, it's just annoying that the major factions all have like very bland color schemes along with bland lore. Um, but I might be wrong. Uh, comment down in the comment section below if you guys think that there is a Forge World that you guys would like me to talk about next that actually has really good lore, um, which I'm probably going to talk about all of them anyways, the, the ones that are in the Codex too. So, um, but yeah. Now it's time to move on to the uh, answering the comments that you guys left off in yesterday's 40 Facts video. So this was the 40 Facts and Lore on the Belrath Crusade. If you guys haven't checked out that video, I really suggest you do because it's really cool how um, the Sons of Medusa, it's a loyalist space marine chapter, completely destroyed a Xeno race. What that Xeno race is, you check out the video. I'll explain and stuff like that. Um, but, um, yeah, let's get into the comments. Also, when you guys leave comments for today's video for me to respond to in tomorrow's video, uh, try to th read through them and thumb up whichever ones you guys want me to react to or respond to, um, just because it's easier for me to get to the ones that you guys want. It seems like there's more and more comments, um every day um so it, it would if you guys can help me out and thumb up whatever question or comment you guys would like to see let's get into it this one comes this question comes from sebastian mezzanato this is more to fans in general but is anyone else worried that when they do finally do a movie series or a legitimate tv show especially live action that is going to be written poorly with over-the-top dialogue that's going to be cringy and rife with no real connection to the general audience because i think about that more than i think about politics or global warming hello well yeah, that is like a, a fear that exists within me too, um, that once we actually do get Eisenhorn, uh, which is a live action series, TV series that's supposed to be coming out for GW, but I think like um, COVID uh, delayed it and stuff, that once you actually get the, um, the dialogue, it's going to be shitty. But then at the same time, like, um, well, we're going to know once this Warhammer... Warhammer TV Plus thing or Warhammer Plus um, app comes out and we get to see these like uh, animations and stuff like that. Um, the key to most non-cringy 40k content I think is um, like not being outwardly like this is 40k because um, there is a lot of cringy old school like the Space Marine movie that was pretty cringy um, but there's also like if you go on Netflix I think it's called Sex, Love, and Robots. They had a mini, like a, a, a little, like, um, what are they called? Like, um, not a mini series, but they had, like, a, a little, like, the very first uh, short that they had was uh, humans going into what seemed like the warp. Uh, and the interactions between the demons who are trying to trick these humans and basically just torture them or eat them. Um, and that was like straight up 40k. Um, and if if uh, the live action movies or TV shows in the future can do something like that, then we're in good hands. Um, there's also been like um, other adaptations uh, in, of the 40k world into like movies and stuff like that that's done pretty well but again the key is not to be outwardly like these are space marines these are um tyranids blah 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 um don't make it like a um uh Dwayne the rock johnson type of movie because those are like pretty shit um make it more like thought-provoking and stuff like that um i think uh rogue one like, if we get Rogue One-style 40K uh, content just to ease the audience into 40K, I would be happy. Like you don't have to show, like, the terrible grim darkness just yet. Ease them into it. Uh, it would be awesome. Uh, 
Also, like, you have to remember that space marines are supposed to be the forefront of this um, universe. That's usually what draws most people into 40k. So there has to be a way for these uh, TV series and these movies to illustrate space marines without it being um, cringy. And that's also a bit of a challenge, because I don't think it's it's been done. Um, yeah. Next question comes from Nico Tugas. Who is your favorite Horus Heresy character, not Primarchs or the Emperor, and why? Uh, Rylanor comes to mind. Uh, ancient Rylanor, he was a dreadnought, a contemptor dreadnought that fought for the Emperor's... Tr- Emperor's... Emperor's Children? Children? Yeah, Emperor's Children Legion. Um... He was one of the loyalists that was going to be killed during the Dropsite Massacre, and his story is really awesome. Uh, we have a 40 Facts video on it. I'll put a link up above. If not, just look up, um, uh, I think it's 40 Facts and Lore on Rylanor the Ancient or the Ancient Rylanor. Uh, his his uh, conclusion, the end, is sad, but pretty cool. Um, next comment comes from Togustus Lumberjack. The thing where two words start with the same letter or sound is a literary device called alliteration. <laughs> that ought to make you an A plus right there. Oh, thanks. Alliteration. That's what I was looking for. I'm probably going to forget by the end of this video, but but thank you. Um, next comment comes from Tax Squirrel Casey West. Sorry for the dogs. <laughs> uh, he says, "Great. Now I can't stop thinking about Doritos." Yeah, Doritos, Doritos are really good. I've been uh, on a Dorito binge for a while. What I like to do is I make a pico de gallo, which is just tomato, onions, and cilantro. Sorry again for the dogs. And then you open up the bag, you put that in there, put a bunch of hot sauce uh, in inside, shake it, and then just enjoy. It's really, really good. And if you can, get uh, cueritos. Cueritos are just... Um, oh, my mouth is watering. Uh, cueritos are just um, pickled pig ears <laughs> they're really really good they're sold in most me- mexican stores um and then if you chop those up and throw them in with the pico de gallo they're amazing uh next question comes from alex dar do you think that marvel fans will eventually become warhammer 40k fans if they make a good mini mini series no i don't think so and i'm uh I think I'm saying this because of, like, what I've seen in the past. Most of my friends that are into Marvel, DC, like, comic books and stuff like that, or that universe, don't really like 40K. I don't know why. My speculation is that when you think of the Warhammer 40K universe, it's a universe that is very sandboxy. It's a universe that's open to you creating whatever you want. Even the name characters, it seems that the audience and the community kind of gives them um, their importance, uh, not so much the other side. So, like, the authors and stuff like that. Whereas, like, with Marvel and DC, the viewer or the reader, the listener, whatever it may be, they... They sit down and they they just take in. Uh, whereas with us, like we created Sly Marbo, it was our like it was the fan base that made him into his own little model and like all that kind of stuff. Excuse me. Um, and when you look at uh, characters like um, what's his name, the Grey Knights, Caldor Drago, um, that is a character that was created by GW specifically Matt Ward to be like a badass. And the, and the community did not accept him. People play him, but there was so much complaints that he was OP, he was not part of... Like, he, he was a Superman character, um, or it seemed like he was a Superman character, or like a, a, a superhero character, and 40k fans are not about that. They're more... Um, like, I feel like D&D people would more likely jump over to 40k because of that uh, concept of, like, they're more creative than the Marvel and DC fan base. Um, but again, that's just, like, a small little glimpse that I've seen throughout the years. Um, I, it could be, I could be wrong, especially now with the comic book on Marnius Calgar coming out. Um, that might introduce, that might have introduced, um, some comic book fans, uh, or Marvel and DC fans into the 40k universe. 
um, if you are one of those people, comment down in the comment section below because, again, there's a lot of um, you guys that listen to the lore portions of these videos and that's more important to you guys uh, than the actual tabletop uh, rants and stuff like that. Um, but, but yeah. I hope that that makes sense. If anything, too, like I think Star Wars fans are also more likely to get into 40k than um, Marvel fans. Uh, but yeah, this next question comes from Justin Parker Hines. Do you think Warhammer will ever become mainstream? And if it does, do you think GW will raise or lower their prices to perhaps make it more financially friendly friendly for new newer players? Uh, no. If uh, Warhammer 40k becomes more mainstream, the universe is going to become popular, which we're going to see a boost to video games, novels, um, but not the tabletop. And the reason I don't think we're going to see a boost to the tabletop is because this, the tabletop is very time consuming. It's very like... Um, it's a commitment that you have to make uh, from building, painting, creating a list, sitting with your friends and playing in an actual space. Um, another big problem that I saw from friends who I was trying to get into 40K, um, those friends didn't like the concept of, oh, I actually have to go to a person's house or a store in order to play. Like they're not about that um, social interaction. Uh, they would much rather just sit at home and play like a video game then go to somebody's house and like hang out, drink, and play games. Um, so uh, I don't think that the tabletop is going to be affected too much by the 40k. Uh, if 40k becomes more mainstream, but I want to be clear that it, like if it does go mainstream, more people will play um, 40k, um, but not as much as like you think. Like it's not going to be a rush of people like Magic. Uh, who want to play 40k now um, and also it's a little scary like it's a, it's scary like if we do get a huge rush of people wanting to play the tabletop I'm scared that they're gonna turn it into like a super competitive magic type of thing and I've never seen 40k like that I think it's always like more fun to play friendly games uh, where, where where I can cheat um, <laughs> than it is like tournament style like every single rule is gonna be nitpicked and stuff like that uh, and then as far as prices, prices are always going to go up. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't think they're going to get lowered to make it more uh, financially friendly. Because again, like GW is putting an effort to make these um, uh, things um, not unique, but like make them uh, your, like so that you can customize them. And it's that time thing uh, that they know that exists. So there's a barrier and that barrier that you have you have to hop over also filters out all the the um what are they called like the stingy people who don't want to spend money um and they i think they know that um, so prices will not go down next question comes from elias ravanati i don't play the game enough to care about buying new orc models just in it for the lore keep it up yes i will superior soldier says now talk about the athonian tunnel rats please i haven't done that uh, Thonian. Oh, there it is. I thought I had done this. Yeah, I have. Uh, so there's a 40 facts in lore on the, they're called the Lugnan Sewer Rats. And it's probably like connected to them somehow. I'll look it up. If not, yes, I'll create a video for you. Um, Rob Kemp says, Psy, another cool Xeno race we now bugger all about. Uh, we know bugger all about. Uh, all heresy complaints will be forwarded to 2010 when when that might have been funny. Yeah, Xeno races in the 40k universe are really awesome, but there's always hope uh, in Blackstone Fortress. Uh, Blackstone Fortress could provide us with like really cool Xeno models. Um, next question comes from Lord or comment comes from Lord Darkness. Don't be shy to advertise your Patreon. People want to support. Uh, support us on Patreon. It's a dollar a month. Just um, thank you. Uh, I, the only reason I forget is because it, I used to have like a little like um, script. Not not something that I wrote down, but like something that I would always repeat in the beginning of the videos. And that was like like, comment, subscribe, support us on Patreon, blah, blah, blah. And I haven't been doing that just because like the structure of the videos have changed. But yes, if you guys want to support us on Patreon, it's just a dollar a month. And understand that that, that dollar is like contributing um, for, it's like a, a donation to us as like thanking us 
for creating this free content on YouTube. Um, and we really appreciate it, um, that dollar. Um, it is so that we can continue to like pump these videos out every single day. Uh, you're not getting any exclusive content on Patreon right now. Uh, maybe in the future that might change. Uh, but it's just Patreon has never been something that like we are super like... Like, it, it started off as something that we figured we can do, like, mini wargaming, like the vault. Um, but then we realized that, like, it feels dumb creating a paywall to talk about lore. Um, it makes sense for mini wargaming to do it because they're uh, battle reports. Uh, so then now we just have it as a donation thing. It, it was never to make money, I guess. Uh, it's just, like... Uh, it's there if you guys want it's like a tip jar if you if, if you want it if you want to support us awesome if not we're going to try our best to create this content we're, we're not we don't have plans of ever going away unless something really bad happens um, but thanks next question comes from TJ Evans my favorite I'm in 40k dream wasn't actually a dream of mine it was a friend who sadly got in a car accident and and he told us later, his first thought was, it's okay, I'm, a, I'm an avatar immune to most of this damage. Avatars are usually not immune to damage. Avatars are usually pretty, like they're weak. Pretty much everything destroys an avatar of Kane. But then you say, yes, he played Eldar that night. Yes, he may have fallen asleep on the way home that night. And yes, none was injured that night. Glad nobody was injured. He said, uh, and it's also 20 years ago. Maybe 20 years ago? Like, what would that be? 5th edition? 4th edition? Maybe um, at that time, um, Avatar of Kane was more powerful on the tabletop, but right now it's crap. And also the models, kind of like, we need a new model for that one. Um, driving a, when you're sleepy, I feel, is like worse than driving uh, under the influence of anything else. Um, I've noticed that, like... I have this thing that if I drive on a straight road for a really long time, um, I get sleepy, and my driving is way worse uh, than than normal. Uh, for I mean, obviously, but um, yeah. And then you go on to say all my all of my I'm in a 40k dream as best as I recollect them are just jumbled up waking up questions from or are just jumbles of waking up questioning imperial doctrines pondering the vast number of worlds slash races and individuals in play or trying to understand the Tyranids' real motives kind of thing. I wish I had those types of uh, moments. Usually when I wake up and, like, I, like the only th time that I've had a situation like that is I woke up and I was thinking, like, what's the life of a Dreadnought like? I remember thinking that. Uh, but also because, like, I was... The night before, I think I read a quote, and it was like, uh, it said that um, death is just sleep being shy or something like that. And I was thinking of, like, like sleep is like death um, when you don't dream, obviously. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's cool that you can have those types of dreams or wake up to those types of um, ideas. You guys have a lot of questions. Uh, Elias Cavanati says, you talk about old fashions in a previous video. Have you ever tried a rusty nail? Uh, I have tried a rusty... Well, no. I I have not tried a rusty nail. Um, when I first turned 21, like I wanted to try a scotch um, cocktail. And a friend who used to play Tyranids, he used to be part of the group. He's actually... He was in one of these... One of our uh, videos. Like a video from a long, long time ago. Um, he, he said I should try the cocktail rusty nail. Uh, and I went to a club like sometime and um, it was like a, a western or southern style like line dancing type of club and I asked the bartender for a rusty or no I first I asked him for a old fashioned he said uh, we don't have bitters and I was like how do you not have bitters like you have a bar like what do you guys give off or uh, what do you guys uh, um, give to your customers and I'm guessing they just drink beer because like most most people from those types of places just drink beer. But anyways, I said, okay, what about a rusty nail? Because I saw that he had scotch. And then he goes like, yeah, sure. And he put orange juice and bourbon. And then he gave that to me. This, this the, either, either the bartender was being purposefully a dick to me. Um, because I was young and I was probably out of place in like a, a southern bar. Um, or yeah, those types of like western bars or whatever. Um, or he just didn't know what it was, but like a rusty nail is supposed to be a blended scotch and 
drum buoy, I think it is called, um, which is supposed to be sweet. It's like honey. I've never had it before, but I want to try it. Um, I probably won't like it just because I don't like sweetness in my cocktails. Um, but if you guys have other suggestions for drinks, let me know what, what they are. I know I've made the comment of like, you guys should go subscribe to How to Drink. Um, it's an awesome YouTube channel. Um, let them know when Mind Syndicate sent you if, if, if you can. Um, there's another YouTube channel that I recently uh, started watching. Let me see if I can pull it up. Um, but it gives me the vibes of like How to Drink back in the early days. So the YouTube channel is Anders Ericsson. He only has 66,000 uh, subscribers. And you know, if you've made it this far, jump on over to his channel and subscribe. Let him know when Mind Syndicate sent you. Um, but he has like a bunch of really awesome cocktail um, uh, YouTube videos that you guys should check out if you're into that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, Anders Ericsson, um, and he deserves more uh, subscribers. And those were the comments uh, for today. If you guys have more uh, questions or comments, please. Let me know in the comment section below, and I'll try to answer them in tomorrow's video. Um, and if if I didn't get to your question or your comment, I'll just respond the normal way. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. This is Gershwan with One Mind Syndicate signing out.